Well, thank, thank you very much for uh, coming and uh, joining us here. My name is Irving Weisdorf. I'm the co-chair of Canadians for Balfour 100. Uh, the better looking co-chair is sitting in front of me, Goldie Steiner. Goldie, you wanted to stand up and uh, wave to the uh, audience? <laughs> uh, I'm also associated with, uh, with two other groups, uh, well, two other organizations that are uh, involved in, uh, in this. One is the Mizzou Freedom Foundation, uh, which I, uh, I founded two years ago uh, because of largely uh, what I perceived as the uh, the continuing, continuing deteriorating situation of Israeli public relations. Uh, and um, more recently, uh, I became the, uh, the second president of the uh, Speaker's Action Group, uh, under whose banner uh, Canadians for Balfour 100 uh, is organizing. Uh, in the back of uh, the room uh, uh, is Joffrey Clarfield, who is the executive director of both organizations and the project manager for uh, Canadians for Balfour. <laughs> Just so I get a feel from uh, of, of the audience, how many people are well acquainted with Balfour? Just put up your hands. And how many are not acquainted at all? Okay. Um, so, uh, <clears throat> the, the Balfour Declaration uh, in, uh, in 1917, that's 100 years ago, uh, and during the First World War, which is very important, uh, the, the British were uh, waging war, of course, against uh, the Ottoman Empire, uh, as well as the Germans uh, and others. And they were trying to garner uh, a support from all groups that might help them. And uh, among these groups that they tried to garner support uh, were the Jews. Now at that time, uh, the Christian communities, or there were many Christian communities, uh, Protestant Christian, uh, who had been steeped in the, in the Old Testament as well as the New Testament. And we don't see that very much today, at least I'm not aware of it. Uh, but uh, there was an affinity, there was a, uh, almost a uh, judophilia uh, uh, that was felt among many Christians, but not all Christians. There was still the, the anti-Semitism that had uh, that had followed Christianity uh, from uh, early Roman times. Um, now, the, uh, the British, the British government, at least some in the British government, were, were eager to uh, engage uh, the Jewish population, which had some influence, uh, not quite as much as uh, some people think. Um, and... And... Uh, they, uh, and, and, and there was also at that time, uh, uh, if you recall Woodrow Wilson, he believed in the self-determination of nations. And the feeling was that we could avoid wars in the future if nations had their own state. And, and that and many other political uh, 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 machinations, I suppose, uh, that went on, led uh, the British government to issue the Balfour Declaration, um, which, uh, actually I'm not sure if I have that. Sorry. Which, which I hope I have the slide of the declaration itself, but uh, essentially it said that uh, the nation, uh, the Jewish nation should reconstitute its homeland in Palestine. Now, if we, uh, many of you know that, that Palestine was a name given uh, to uh, the kingdom of Judah uh, by Titus um, in an attempt to erase uh, the memory of the Jews. 
Uh, this was after the Bar Kokhba revolt and, and uh, the purpose, uh, th this was sort of punishment because the Jews, the, the Jews were not always meek and afraid and, uh, and living in ghettos. Uh, they were, they had a nation, uh, a nation state uh, in what is now called Palestine, uh, what was then called Palestine, which is more than, which is more than the land west of the Jordan. It encompassed at various times much of the land east of the Jordan, which today is the, uh, is the, is the Hashemite kingdom of Jordan, um, and which I will refer to uh, later as the first Palestinian Arab state. So uh, that, that's some of the background. Uh, let me just tell you a little bit about the, uh, the organization. I'll come back to more. Uh, Canadians for Balfour 100 is a coalition of organizations and individuals, members of the international community, celebrating the 100th anniversary of the Balfour Declaration. So the, the declaration was in 2017. Uh, it was before the Ottomans had been defeated. And it was before it was before Britain actually controlled uh, Palestine. Uh, our goal is to educate the wider public on its meaning and implications. Now, hmm, this did not, this was added just uh, last night, and I was hoping it would come out a little more clearly uh, than it is. But uh, we have on the left-hand side, uh, in addition to founders who are uh, from Toronto. We have affiliated interna international organizations, uh, affiliated national organizations, including, uh, including B'nai B'rith and the uh, Coalition for Israel's uh, Legal Rights, uh, CIJR, um, and so forth. So it's, it, we're, we're trying to form a broad coalition that will uh, use the Balfour Declaration as the uh, entrance point to making the most important assertion that we can make and the, and the, the most important uh, approach to fighting uh, BDS, Israel Apartheid Week, and the delegitimization of Israel in general. The challenge today. Today's North American and European mainstream media and academia, aided by the United Nations and largely by the European Union, falsely portray Israel as a white settler state that displaced Arabs who used to live west of the Jordan, and that Israel now occupies stolen Arab land. Nothing could be further from the truth. There's been an inversion of reality. The Arab narrative is now dominant. Certainly on campuses, and if you were any, any of you were upstairs uh, for the last hour session, uh, what was going on at McMaster is just unbelievable. The Arab narrative presents the Jews as Goliath and the Arabs of Palestine as David. Now, if we looked at a map, and I don't have, have one to show you right now, but I'm sure you've seen, seen one. If we looked at a map of the Arab states, uh, of which there are 30 plus, and the Muslim states, of which there are 50 plus, the size of the, of the uh, population and the size of the territory uh, are phenomenal, uh, and, and uh, there is absolutely no question of who is David in this, in this uh, battle and who is Goliath. But it's been very cleverly done, and by creating the concept of a Palestinian nation, uh, which was roughly done in 1967, uh, there was no clamor for a Palestinian state before 1967 when Jordan controlled uh, Judea and Samaria, uh, by, by creating the Palestinian nation, uh, the Arab propagandists have successfully uh, cre inverted reality and, uh, and turned the Palestinians into, uh, into David. Uh, the big lie strategy of Joseph Goebbels, and I, I hope Everyone here knows who Joseph Goebbels is. If anybody doesn't, you can raise their hand. Okay, Joseph Goebbels was the, prop the, was the uh, Nazi uh, head of the Ministry of Propaganda. And Joseph Goebbels 
believe that the bigger the lie, the more likely it was to be believed. Because nobody would tell a really big lie. We all fib, right? We all fib. But nobody would tell a really big lie unless it were true. Well, nobody would say something really outrageous unless it were true. So nobody would say, uh, as I heard uh, 15 minutes ago upstairs, that Israeli soldiers shoot out the eyes of Palestinian children, but they only shoot out one eye to make the child suffer more. So the big lie was very successful, and, and the Nazis convinced uh, many, many people uh, uh, that the Jews were the source of all problems in the world, that the Jews were vermin, that the Jews were subhuman, and so it, it, it's a function of the propaganda initiative of a Muslim-Nazi alliance that goes back to the mid-1930s and still ongoing. Here we have a picture of Hitler, who is clearly recognizable. And I don't know if everybody recognizes the other gentleman. Uh, well, gentlemen might be stretching it uh, <laughs> in the picture. And that is the Grand Mufti, Hajim bin Husseini. And the Grand Mufti, uh, not everybody knows, was an ally. Now, the Grand Mufti is the, is the head of the, uh, he's the chief religious figure in Jerusalem. And he was an ally of Hitler. Uh, he visited uh, Germany many times. He raised Nazi troops from among the Muslim population in the Balkans. And uh, uh, he is sometimes said to be the uncle of Arafat, although I'm not sure that that's entirely true, but he, he sort of was the, if he wasn't the biological uncle, he was probably the, um, uh, the intellectual uncle of, of Arafat. And so uh, the, the Mufti uh, started, to, started to develop a scenario for when the Nazis would uh, control Palestine. And uh, he had his own uh, concept of concentration camps and extermination camps uh, uh, mapped out for when that would happen. However, as we know, it didn't happen. The false narrative, uh, I, I would add, add something else to this uh, previous slide, which uh, I only learned uh, about last year. There was someone uh, called Johann von Leers. And Johann von Leers worked for Goebbels, uh, and he, among uh, hundreds of German Nazi propagandists, uh, moved to Egypt after the war. And uh, he was welcomed by uh, Gamal Abdel Nasser, uh, who was the president of Egypt. And uh, he set up. Uh, to develop the propaganda machine for, for Egypt. And, and we, will, we see how the, what the connectivity is. Um, fake news, well, that's a phrase that's become popular uh, lately. Um, the false Arab narrative using catchwords like Israel apartheid, BDS, and the myth of occupation is now repeatedly referred to in the mainstream media including CNN, BBC, CN, uh, CBC, ABC. You know, you'll see Chris Matthews using terminology. You'll see uh, uh, Rod, Roger Williams? No. Uh, anyways, you'll see them all. And, and they will, and so what's happened is that fake news uh, permeated, permeates the, the, the mainstream media now. Uh, as a result, as a result of this, this activity in the background uh, that is connected directly to Nazi propagandists, uh, former Nazi propagandists, and, and that is funded by Iran, by Saudi Arabia, by oil money in general. Two-state solution, the real meaning. The notion of a two-state solution was always a non-starter. 
One need just listen to the consistently repeated mantra expressed by Mahmoud Abbas and his minions proclaiming from the river to the sea, Palestine will be free. Free, of course, means free of Jews. Because as we see in two of the Palestinian Arab states, in, uh, in Jordan and in Gaza, uh, the Palestinians are hardly, hardly experienced freedom there. two-state solution, the real advocacy problem. Uh, this week I've been reading a, a book recently published by Dan Luz uh, called A Free Nation in Our Land. He talks about, he talks about um, advocacy. And he points something out in, in very simple and effective words. The real problem with Bibi's very acceptance of a two-state solution means that we should not be in Judea and Samaria since in the two-state solution, Israel must leave these lands. And, and the, result of, uh, the result of even suggesting it, and, and uh, Iluz goes further and he says the, the foreign ministry has been focusing not on selling Israel, but on selling the two-state solution. That Shimon Peres, when he was foreign minister, turned the whole, the whole advocacy program around. And no matter what the Palestinian Arabs did, Israel was to support the two-state solution. Now, if you support the two-state solution, two-state solution reminds me of the old story of King Solomon. Uh, and, and which I learned, and many of you may have learned in, in uh, Hebrew school, that, that two mothers, two pregnant women give birth at the same time, and one has a stillborn child, and one has a healthy child. And the woman with the stillborn child claims that the healthy child is hers. And ultimately, this argument is brought before the king. And King Solomon says, let's divide the child in two. And the, the woman whose child was stillborn says, yes, good, that's a good solution. And of course, the woman whose child it really was said no. The two-state solution reminds me of this. It's not exactly analogous, but it says, if we are so willing to give up Judea and Samaria, maybe we don't have any right to it. If I were, if I were neutral on the outside, I would really wonder, why are the, the, the Jews, well, maybe they are stealing the land, and they just, they're happy with part of it. But the reality is that if we don't, if we don't have a right to Judea and Samaria, well, Jews come from Judea, just like Arabs come from Arabia. If this is not, if we do not have a right to this land, and I'm not suggesting solutions. My good friend here, Mark Vandermas, taught me P, uh, truth must come before solutions. We have to state the truth. We have not only a claim, we have the claim to this land. Jews are the only nation that ever had a capital in Judea and Samaria, let alone in all of Palestine. <clears throat> Cherry tomatoes. Now, we know, or some of us know, that Sija, the, the Canadian voice for, uh, for the Jewish community in advocacy, believes that um, shared values is the best way to advocate for Israel. Is there anyone from Sija here? No. <clears throat> and all I can say is, and this is also uh, mentioned in, uh, in Danny Luz's book, does anyone believe the development of flash drives 
and cherry tomatoes, and even instant messaging that we are using constantly all day, will convince a neutral observer to support a warmongering apartheid state that occupies the land of an indigenous people. And yet, the Jewish community, certainly in Toronto and generally everywhere, uh, that, is, that is the campaign for ad of advocacy that they, have been, that they have been supporting. And we shouldn't wonder why it's not been effective. The Balfour Declaration, 1917. I have much pleasure in conveying to you on behalf of His Majesty's government the following declaration of sympathy with the Jewish Zionist aspirations which has been submitted to and approved by cabinet. His Majesty's government view with, a favor, with favor the establishment in Palestine and at this point Palestine includes the East Bank and the West Bank of the Jordan. The establishment in Palestine of a national home for the Jewish people and will use their best endeavors to facilitate the achievement of this object. It being clearly understood that nothing shall be done which may prejudice the civil and religious rights of existing non-Jewish organizations or the rights and political status enjoyed by Jews in any other country. Uh, I should be grateful if you would bring this declaration to the knowledge of the Zionist Federation. You are sincerely Arthur James Balfour, who was sent to Lord Rothschild, who was a leader of the British community. Now, it's very important to note that the British were, were, were concerned about two things. They were concerned about the civil and religious rights of non-Jews living in Palestine, essentially Arabs, some Muslims, some Christian. And they were also concerned about the rights and political status enjoyed by Jews of other countries. And it's beyond the scope of this uh, presentation, but many of you know that uh, close, to, uh, close to a million Jews uh, were forced to leave their homes uh, in Morocco, in Algeria, in uh, Yemen, in Tunisia, and in Iraq. The Jews in Iraq dated back to the destruction of the Second Temple. Second Temple. First Temple. First Temple. Now, I'm sorry this is so blurry. It was the best one I could pull off the internet last night. Uh, this is Jordan, all of which was part of Palestine. And we see Israel and the West Bank. We don't see uh, Judea and Samaria there mapped out, but it's, uh, of course, right there. So we see that Transjordan, which was hived off in uh, 1922, uh, from the mandate. Uh, Transjordan comprises about 74% of Palestine. So if anyone says to you, is there a Palestinian Arab state? There is, it's a very big one. Now more recently, thanks to what I consider to be a rather large mistake by uh, one of the Israeli generals who was a great general and a poor politician. Gaza is a second Arab state, Palestinian Arab state, taken from Palestine. Now, whatever you think about solutions, one has to think very carefully if what is needed now is a third Palestinian Arab state comprising Judea and Samaria. San Remo, 1920. The Balfour Declaration began as a letter of intent reflecting British policy. Less than three years after its publication, it became a document of international law when its provisions were textually adopted and became part of Britain's obligations at the San Remo Peace Conference. 
So the Balfour Declaration, and I'm going to repeat it for emphasis, was not a legal document. It was only an expression uh, of the uh, British government's uh, interest in forming uh, and, and support in forming a Jewish uh, homeland. Uh, it was only after it was included in the San Remo Peace Conference in 1920 that it took on uh, the, the first of its, legal, of its legal status. Now, I mentioned it before, uh, Woodrow Wilson and the, the uh, um, self-determination of nations. But if you read, if you read books about, about what happened after the First World War, you'll see that all the, all the nations that didn't have their own land that had been subjugated in one form or another got in line at the peace conference and, and begged and pleaded and presented arguments for their own, their own states. And so, so the Jews were not the only recipients of the goodwill of the world at that time. As a matter of fact, the Jewish homeland was put on hold while uh, in 1922, with the issuance of the Mandate for Palestine, uh, the uh, Kingdom of Transjordan was, uh, was created. As well, Iraq was created at the same time. Syria was created at the same time. Jordan, uh, uh, Lebanon was created at the same time as well. So all of these states were created as a result of mandates. The mandate for Palestine, uh, 1922, uh, was included. So, so the, the Balfour Declaration was included in the preamble of the mandate for Palestine, and then it became a key document that supports the rebirth of the nation of Israel and Palestine. Hence, some people like to refer to it as Israel's birth certificate. I like to refer to uh, Balfour as the, uh, as the Emperor Cyrus of our day. Not exactly our day, but the Emperor Cyrus, as you know, gave the permission uh, for Jews to return to Jerusalem to build the, se the second temple, and uh, Cyrus the Great. And, and Balfour, uh, Presented, presented his concept of, a, of, of the uh, recreation of the Jewish homeland. And it's important to note that this concept of the recreation of the Jewish homeland was not a result of the Holocaust. It's very important to note because the Arabs are saying that, ah, the Europeans are afflicting us with the Jews because of what they did to them in the Holocaust. And that's not, a, not at all true. <coughs> so the time has come on this, the year of the 100th anniversary of the Balfour Declaration to create a clear movement and a multifaceted campaign to reclaim the true narrative about Israel's place to the land. So what, what Canadians for Balfour 100 want to do is change the focus of advocacy from shared values to Jewish rights. Jews have legal rights to the land. They are the only nation that has ever had a state in that land. And unless we proclaim that, unless we stand up, and unless we get the government of Israel to change its tune, and I'm hoping, I'm hoping that it will, because there have been some signs, and maybe the new president uh, and Netanyahu are thinking, have changed their focus and, and are thinking in a better direction than the past. But unless we do, we will not be able to change the minds and hearts of neutral observers, of non-Jews, who are not, not everybody is focused on Israel. We have some wonderful allies in the non-Jewish community, but not everybody is focused on Israel. People have their daily lives. 
uh, people have their own their own communities. But we need to we need to go beyond the Jewish community because, frankly, we don't have the votes. So so Canadians for Balfour 100 want to change at the advocacy and starting this year, but this is not going to be a one year campaign. This is going to be a multi-year campaign. Public relations. Canadians for Balfour 100 will facilitate the design and impl implementation of a public relations and educational campaign to tell the story of Israel's legal rights to the land, from the river to the sea. Social media campaign. It is possible to influence public opinion with a well-funded campaign and internet. With input from a PR company uh, that we've already chosen, we must think of the power of social media, internet, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, ads and billboards. Thus we can reach communities of all ethnic, religious and cultural backgrounds. It may feel like climbing Mount Everest, but we firmly believe that the day will come when our hard work will bear fruit and truth and justice will prevail. We need to attract influential men and women of letters, filmmakers, and other celebrities to assist us in our campaign to get pro balfour messages to worldwide audience. The recently deceased author, Joan Peters, who started this book uh, to document the uh, atrocities of the Jews in, in, in Palestine. And through meticulous work in the archives, she found out that the reverse is true. Her pioneering work showed the extraterritorial origins of the Arabs. They came from Egypt, they came from Yemen, they came from all over. And the origins of the Arab-Jewish conflict over Palestine. Peters is the kind of public intellectual we need on our side. There are many others like her. We must engage them. Our quest and goal is to educate aggressively with gloves on. Joffrey put those words in. I don't know why with gloves on. I might take them off. <laughs> we believe this kind of popular action can give results. We can change minds among those who still think for themselves and weigh issues on their merits. Simply put, the goal of Canadians for Balfour 100 is to give the Balfour Declaration the intellectual and public relations gravitas that will allow it to gain accelerated public awareness in a world permeated with political correctness. George Washington wrote many years ago, if the freedom of speech is taken away, then dumb and silent we may be led like sheep to the slaughter. If we lose our freedom to publicly defend Israel, as we have on the campuses, then we have lost our basic democratic right freedom of speech. Jewish students are threatened when they defend Israel's right to exist. We must change the climate where a punch of Zionist has become the motive. As the project grows, Canadians for Balfour 100 will make every effort to work with a broad range of international partners to get the true story of Israel out to the wider public. Winston Churchill. You have enemies? Good. That means you've stood up for something, sometime in your life. So let's not, let's not fear. Thank you. I'm, o I'm open to questions or uh, even short statements. Yeah, I, I Charles? Welcome to Charles. Where does it take us today? Now, I'm a realist, I think, pragmatist, and practical. You could stand up, Trump. Sure. <coughs> and, you, you know, 
historically you didn't talk about 242 and long-standing Western, in particular American policy about the two states for two people. What you're really saying without saying it, frankly, is one state uh, in, in that territory, but without having saying it explicitly. And to me, that's a solution for perpetual conflict. Whether the Palestinians have a right to the territory historically, today, that's their national aspiration. I can't say it's right or wrong, it exists. So how do you deal with it? You can't deal with it in the bosom of one state. So either you're talking about a state that at the very least, as a Jewish democracy, is threatened if you maintain all the territories, or you have a two-state solution. It's the least worst, perhaps, a set of bad solutions. So when you take that historical argument that you made, and you extrapolate and extend it, what you're really advocating for is a one-state solution. Which I think no. Is a for us. Okay. Let me let me answer that. Let me answer. Let me answer that. Let me answer that. I, I may have uh, my my uh, uh, beliefs as to what might be a solution. I don't think we have. To, I, the point I'm trying to make is we don't have to talk about a solution. Now, if you think that a two-state solution is the best alternative that we have, uh, it's beyond the scope of this discussion. But I'd be happy to discuss it with you. Uh, uh, offline, and uh, be, because if, if you go to the heights of Judea and Samaria, you realize that it would be the ultimate folly to create a state, a, a full state for a population that really exists not because they want a state, because they've had wonderful options to have a state. Ehud Barak offered them 97% of, uh, the, and, and I don't believe, I don't believe that old maxim that Palestinians never, uh, never miss an, opportunity miss an opportunity to miss an opportunity. On the contrary, Palestinians do not, the Palestinian Arab leadership does not want a state. And anyone who thinks otherwise has to have their head examined. The Palestinian Arab leadership, their goal has been since 1948 and even before since since the Grand Mufti, has been to prevent the existence of a Jewish state. And that's why, in my opinion, they have not accepted a state in any part because they, accepting a state would require them to accept a Jewish state in the other part. That's my feeling. Well, but, I, but okay. yeah, I'm happy to discuss it with you further. Alec? Yes, thank you. Uh, it was an excellent presentation. And uh, my question really is why you haven't mentioned the idea that in the peace treaty of 1922, when the other Arab states were created, uh, Iraq, uh, Lebanon, Jordan, etc., uh, basically, if you say everything is okay except Israel, doesn't that invalidate the creation of those other states? I, th I think we're finding historically that the, the uh, Creation of Iraq is is already invalidated. Lebanon Lebanon ha, has has uh, uh, long ago uh, fallen apart. Syria is currently one of the greatest human disasters uh, imaginable. So yes, and I'm sorry I didn't mention it. I'm glad you did because it's it's it is very important. Who uh, this young lady here? Hi. So I have a question. So could you stand up if you don't mind? Yeah. Thanks. So how do you take all this information and use it in today's present where the UN is pretty much saying, okay, the West Bank is illegally occupied, so there's an international law where it is okay for the Arabs living there to throw rocks. Like, how do you use that information to contradict? Well, you use, it's, it's a really good question, um, and it's a long path. You use that information as an entrance point. You use that information to point out that Israel does not exist because of the Holocaust, and that Israel does exist because, uh, because it is the only indigenous uh, nation to the area that has been called Palestine in the past and is now called uh, Israel. It, it's a long, it's, an, it, it's, it's the topic for another lecture, I'm afraid, but, but it's a very good question. Uh, Lloyd, I'm going to ignore you for a second because I don't want to play favorites. I don't want to play favorites and there's a better looking uh, person in the audience right behind you. Ryan Belarus, I'm not sure if you've heard, but I think 
and he's speaking here t uh, today. Right. We 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 are acquainted with them, but we haven't we haven't been working with them yet. Okay. Yeah. Sir. Uh, you that, uh, <coughs> Could you stand up? You said you mentioned that Netanyahu has not really gone in the same direction, but he just discusses with the Trump. Would they agree that they would prefer to have a one state solution instead of two? I think that that's only partially uh, that's only partially um, correct in that they've discussed it, but I don't think they've agreed on anything. They left it quite, quite vague. And there are other, there are other alternatives. Um, I think uh, Moti Kadar, who is speaking, who's the, the uh, keynote speaker tonight, uh, may be talking about his idea of creating uh, uh, independent emirates for the, uh, for the clans in, uh, in Judea and Samaria so that they could have uh, autonomy Without, um, without actually uh, uh, all the all the uh, attributes of a of an actual state, so I I think we have to wait and see. Uh, Trump uh, is saying many things. Uh, generally, we know the direction he's going, but I'm not sure that we know the specifics yet. David, Hi. Um, so, so I've studied a lot of this could stuff. could you stand up, please? I've studied a lot of this. Both academically and I'm involved as well on campus at Western. Um, a lot, one of the narratives that the uh, SBHR, the pro BDSI, uses <coughs> is that um, Israel violates international law by having uh, Israelis live in the West Bank or Judea and Samaria. It just kind of like, almost in a way that kind of aligns in the inverse of what you're saying because, you know, there are Arabs living in. Judea and Samaria who were born there. Yes. And, 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 and they say that Israel transfers people, but in fact, most Israelis who live in Judea and Samaria, the West Bank, were born there. So, so does it, like, what kind of, what is the kind of what, so what's, what's the argument? What, what, yeah. are your, what are your implications? Right. Well, first of all, now what is that? Joffrey, can you help me with the... Uh, The, the internet, the, the law that, that references transfer of, uh, transfer of population. That does not apply, Geneva. pardon? Geneva Convention. The Geneva Convention. The Geneva Convention does not apply here. And what I would suggest, is it in Solomon's book? Uh, I would suggest, and I have a copy, it's, it's, it's back there, but I would, I would suggest uh, you may want to buy a, a a, uh, a very, very good book on all the details and the laws, etc., by, by uh, uh, Solomon uh, Ben Zimra, who passed, passed away very recently. It's a wonderful book, and, uh, and it will give you some, some insight into some of, some of those more detailed, more detailed things. There has been no transfer of population in the, in, in the context of the Geneva Convention. Sorry, go ahead. Um, in the reading that I've been doing recently, I discovered that uh, around the uh, uh, turn of the 1900s, the that century, uh, the uh, land was only 10% occupied. Um, and there were around 600,000 Jews, uh, sorry, 600,000 Palestinian Arabs, and uh, maybe 60,000, 70,000 Jews, mostly in Jerusalem. But it would strike me that your argument would be improved by letting everybody know that ninety percent of the actual physical land was unoccupied. I, I'm, I appreciate your I appreciate your bringing it up. Mm -hmm. Yes, and and there have been travelers through Palestine, famous travelers, who have documented that uh, that that it was largely unpopulated. Uh, as well, and I'll just add a add a a, a short segue. The the, uh, this, this idea that there is an East Jerusalem and a West Jerusalem, there isn't, there's Eastern Jerusalem and Western Jerusalem, and Eastern Jerusalem, interestingly, doesn't have any Jews in it. And why doesn't it have any Jews in it? Because it was 
occupied, really occupied, by the Kingdom of Jordan. And the Kingdom of Jordan expelled all the Jews. So there's no wonder that East Jerusalem, the eastern part of Jerusalem, has no Jews in it. I'm trying to give uh, everyone a chance. I can't see your name from here. Uh, Irving, uh, I agree with your analysis of what would make sense. From the PR perspective about selling, right, selling the narrative, I understand that one of Valper's uh, descendants just came out with a statement oh. saying, have you seen it? Or no, I haven't seen it. Okay, so I, I haven't read it yet, but I think Professor Berkowitz just did an analysis. Because he, I think the narrative he was saying is that it's, you know, the reason for anti-Semitism now is, you know, is Israel. So I'm wondering, I guess you haven't heard about it, how you sort of deal with that narrative where a descendant of Balfour is saying, guess what, I don't even you know. Well, frankly, I don't, I don't think that the descendant of anybody uh, has, has, a, acquires any authority because he's the descendant of someone. You're right. Malibu you know, Malibu. just, uh, we, we, were just, we were just talking upstairs about uh, Miko Pellet, who has become one of the worst Jewish Israel bashers uh, that exist today, and he was the son of a great general in the, in, in the IDF. So I would disregard, I would disregard um, uh, the, pardon? Yeah, bloodlines. Yeah, disregard bloodlines. Uh, I do not look uh, to um, the Hollywood stars to uh, tell me uh, what is or isn't kosher. Uh, I, don't, I don't look at... But, but I, that's not what I'm saying. Right. You, it, it, you're trying to sell a story. Right? Yeah. Saying, yes, yes. Well, yeah. Well, yes, but who are going to use him as something to validate the story? I guess that's all. I do. Yes, I, I, you know, um, we have to address it. Yes, Ruth. I, I know facts are part of the problem because um, winning narrative wins much more than facts. But I find most people don't know that the West Bank is divided into three sections: area A under Palestinian authority control, area B under joint Israeli and Palestinian control, Israelis controlling the military, because they have to, they would be killed otherwise. And 98% of the Arab population lives in areas A and B. Yeah. The Jewish population lives in area C, the largest and almost all desert in Iowa. And when you understand that, and that's part of your map, Ruth, I will take that into consideration for for the next for the next presentation. Now, now it's uh, five after four, uh, and the other the, the next uh, presentations are starting. Thank you very much for coming. Um, there there is going to be a petition on the Mazud website www.mazud.mozud.